G'day guys and welcome back to another Wednesday night live stream. So tonight we have a very special guest, Aaron Stonehouse from the Liberal Democrats over in WA, kind enough to come on and talk guns and um, laws and what has been happening to your guns over in WA. Because on this side of Australia, it's sort of, uh, yeah, not a lot of people know about about that side really I've found. So we're going to be talking about that. But before we start, please hit the subscribe button, the notification bell. And find us on and on Instagram and Facebook, and also Parlor is back up, so we are back on Parlor, which I will be using more in Facebook from now on. So uh, also give it this video a thumbs up; would really appreciate it. And you can, if you like this video, you can find us on Patreon and support the show. So I'll just bring the guys in here. G'day, guys. How are you? Welcome, Aaron and Jason. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Um, Parlor's back up, so the lefties are going crazy, which is exciting for everybody. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And your screen is frozen, Jason. I don't know if it's me or you. Sorry, guys. Might be the extra person. It's looking all right on mine. You guys are coming through crystal clear. So sorry about guys if mine's not coming through. I don't know what's doing it. Everything seems fine on my end. Nothing open. So anyway, I have to continue. Yep, exactly. Um, so, Aaron, you're um, the youngest uh, politician in Western Australian history when you won at 27 years old. Not bad at all. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of um, a bit of a fluke, uh, a bit of a surprise, um, completely unexpected for me. Uh, I was actually uh, I'd actually gone to bed the night of the election. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea uh, I had any chance of winning. So I uh, clocked off early at about 11 p.m. And then I got woken up in the middle of the night by um, by the, the party president here in WA. Uh, and he said, are you watching the election results? I said, no. He goes, oh, it looks like you're probably going to win. I'm like, oh, okay. Shit, that probably means I need to quit my job and put in notice. Uh, his first piece of advice was I should go and delete my Facebook account, <laughs> delete, delete all my social media, because the next thing that was going to happen was journos are going to be out Googling me and, you know, combing through my social media history. So uh, yeah, it was a bit of, bit of an unexpected thing, but a bit of a wild ride since uh, the last four years. Um, learned a lot. Uh, you know, you, you make a few gaffes along the way, but um, but I'm really enjoying it. You know, uh, it gives you an opportunity to, um, to do some pretty great stuff. Uh, and to, and to try to, you know, genuinely help people. Um, and I feel that there's a lot of work unfinished. There's a lot of stuff I'd like to see through. So having another tilt at it, we'll see, we'll see if I can um, not, not repeat my luck. I don't think I'm going to get a good ballot draw again, but uh, well, I don't have a good ballot draw. Um, but, but to see if, you know, see if we can get the Lib Dems elected in their own right, uh, on their own merit. So we're running a real campaign round uh, this time around and um, putting on a lot of effort, working really hard uh, to try to boost our vote here in WA. That's good. Well, it's uh, actually good to see someone that is not a lawyer, merchant banker or a banker or someone of those <laughs> lines in yeah. Parliament because that's what the, the uh, whole Parliament system here in Australia is meant to be for the common people, for um, people from different fields of life. But always there seems to be extremely rich people working in the private sector, weaseling their way in. So it was actually really good to see someone who um, from the outside coming in. And that's probably why you've made a big difference and you have um, a few more morals than the typical uh, career politician. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the members and the candidates for the Liberal Democrats are just normal people. You know, we, we don't have, uh, you know, union lawyers or, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, people who've, who've never had a real job and have been a political staffer their entire life. Like, uh, that's not who we're fielding. We're, you know, we're fielding, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, doctors, engineers, uh, small business owners, uh, you know, people who work in the mining sector. Uh, they're just average people uh, with normal jobs. Uh, you know, and uh, granted, they probably don't have a lot of political experience, um, but, uh, but they believe in the principles of freedom. You know, they, they believe in, in protecting people's rights and getting the government off their back, and that's the important thing. Uh, so we've assembled, a, you know, I think in WA a great team, running more candidates than we've ever done before, uh, and and running, you know, a real ground campaign. You know, we're out there door knocking on doors, uh, we're out there talking to uh, talking to voters, uh, and uh, you know, and, and I guess we'll see if uh, if it all comes together on March 13th. What's uh... I guess this last probably, what, four years? What's this last four years been like? I mean, we see, 
I mean, McGowan, I mean, where do you even say, yeah, where do you even go with McGowan at this stage? But anyway, um, what's it been like the last four years dealing with the the Labor government? Seems to be quite a lot of cock-ups along the way, you know, big fights with Clive Palmer, you know, threatening to yeah, potentially bankrupt the state. So, yeah, what's happening, I guess, in Parliament with Labor and what's this last four years been like? Yeah, it's been a wild ride. It, it, it goes really quick. Um, but... Uh, Look, it's been rather disappointing. You know, you've got a Labor Party here uh, that is hugely popular and uh, can pretty much do whatever it wants. It gets very little scrutiny from the media, but perhaps more disappointingly, it gets no scrutiny from the official opposition party. You know, the Liberals are uh, just keeping their seats warm at this point. Uh, they offer very little opposition in Parliament. Uh, they offer very little uh, leadership in terms of um, policy or ideas or presenting an alternate vision. Um, and, and that's really bad for democracy. It's really bad for WA. Quite often, Labor comes up with some harebrained, you know, socialist nonsense, uh, and the Liberal Party votes for it and supports it uh, more often than not. Uh, so, you know, look, uh, if if we had some real opposition in Parliament, you know, my position on the crossbench would be more influential. But quite often, it's just me and a, and maybe a, you know two or three other crossbenchers uh, standing against uh, the major parties and their you know their big government agenda, which is really disappointing. Um, We've had some really, really uh, shocking stuff in the last four years. You mentioned the Clive Palmer issue. Look, you know, I know a lot, a lot of people don't like Clive Palmer. He's, he's a bit of a character, to say the least. But um, what the government did around Clive Palmer was absolutely uh, terrifying. You know, they, they passed a bill. For those unfamiliar with it, Clive Palmer claimed that the government uh, hadn't upheld its end of a contract uh, that the government entered into. And so he was suing the state government for breach of that contract uh, to simplify things. Uh, and so the state government passed a law to uh, basically re retrospectively tear up the contract uh, and deny Clive Palmer his rights uh, and, and his, his right to appeal the decision uh, and also indemnify the state government for if anybody sued it in the future. And that's kind of really scary stuff, you know, to pass a law that says this individual, this one person doesn't have rights in this state and, and is denied natural justice. You know, if it happened to somebody like Clive Palmer, you know, who's to say it couldn't happen to others? Uh, and yeah, he may be an unpopular guy here in WA, but you know your your rights, your human rights, your legal rights uh, are, are not up to a popularity contest. Everybody has them, or else nobody does. You know, uh, so you, you get some really scary stuff like that uh, can happen when when labor is so popular and they don't face scrutiny uh, from the media, uh, and and the only people putting up a fight in Parliament are uh, you know Lib Dems uh, um, and and uh, and what, whatever support I can scrounge up from the cross bench. Yes, uh, I've yeah I've watched uh, some of your speeches and everything uh, through YouTube, and it's definitely like you're on a yeah fighting a, a big battle there. You sort of just seem to be alone um, amongst mm. all the big boys, and you've done really well. I've got to say, you've done really well there. So um, you're an NSC member, and you do like we talked before, and you like shooting pistols. Uh, I'm, I'm a yeah. big pistol shooter as well. Yeah, yeah, handguns is what I've done most of. Uh, so um, back when I back when I still had my weekends free, uh, unfortunately, um, political work takes up most of my time right now. But uh, I was doing a bit of practical pistol um, at uh, Jaredell here in WA. Uh, crack pistols, great. It's, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, it's uh, you know you you work in the holster, you, you're reloading on the go, you're engaging multiple targets. You know you get the little and you know, the obstacle course going as well, it's a hell of a lot of fun because you're combining all these uh, all these various different actions and disciplines together, you know, to get sort of as close to the real thing as you can get, um, which which I find really enjoyable. Um, it's just not the same shooting at steel plate. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, do, I do pistol when I can. Um, don't have time to maintain my membership at Jaredell, but... Uh, uh, I get to I get to Lone Rangers when I can. That's a, an indoor shooting range we have here in Perth, um, which is open to the public. You can go in and you pay a fee, and you can introduce people to shooting, which is great. Uh, it's where I introduced my girlfriend to shooting, took her there, and, and taught her all about guns. Uh, I've even taken some of my um, my electorate office staff there for a Christmas party. We did some shooting too, um, but otherwise, uh, uh, that that's that's a great place um, uh, and and really accessible too. But do a little bit of skeet shooting when I can. Um, uh, but that, that all depends on, uh, you know, when I can get out and, uh, and who's got a shotgun to lend me. Um, but, uh, but I enjoy that too. Wanted to, 
One of the big ones, um, people we know you were pushing it and probably still are a long time ago was airsoft. And uh, we, we know there was, yeah, you know, this is the problem. The, the Labor, the Liberals, the Nationals, they say they help gun owners, especially the Nationals try and court the, the gun owning vote. But, you know, the last 20 years since Port Arthur, they've you know, pretty much done nothing for shooters yet try and court their vote uh, at every opportunity. So how's this airsoft thing going? I know when you tried to, think, if I'm correct, you tried to put into Parliament, uh, you had the Liberals and Nationals supporting it. Uh, then it was sort of filibustered and sort of ushered under the carpet by the Labor Party. So can you just tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, off, first off, let me um, let me address uh, what what might be a contentious issue. You know, I know uh, Airsoft, um, there are a lot of firearm owners who get concerned about uh, my push for Airsoft. You know, some think it's a distraction, it's it's not important. Uh, there are some people who are concerned that if, if you brought in Airsoft, uh, you know, it, it may open the door to um, uh, the police having more power to uh, to ban firearms based on appearance and, and, th and things like that. So there are some there are some that see it as a uh, you know if you start messing with the Firearms Act, there's a risk that the police will overreach and grab more power. Um, and I can appreciate those concerns because you know as we know, firearm owners get the rough end of the stick or the rough end of the pineapple constantly, right? Um, it, it, it all depends on how you regulate it. Uh, my general uh, you know. My, my genuinely held belief is that if you get something like uh, airsoft, you you know you're you're, you're opening people's minds to uh, to the sport of shooting. You know you may only be shooting a plastic BB, um, but it is a hell of a lot more accessible than a firearm to shoot a plastic BB. It, it's a lot easier to get a hold of, uh, and, and you can start to get people sort of used to the idea of being around firearms and treating firearms safely. You know it's funny when I played airsoft in uh, New Zealand. Um, one thing I noticed was the incredible trigger discipline of everybody who was playing airsoft. You know, you wouldn't expect it. that the, the toy guns would shoot a plastic BB, but everybody had great, great uh, trigger discipline, great muzzle discipline. Um, nobody was flagging anybody. It was actually, it was actually really nice to see. But um, uh, so I, I, I don't think airsoft uh, poses a risk to firearms. I think it actually provides an opportunity to normalize firearms in, in our society, which is important because, as you say, you know, since Port Arthur, everybody is terrified of guns. You know, you see, you see articles. I remember a few years ago, there was a uh, breakfast talk shows were um, were falling over themselves to condemn parents that took their kid to Martin Place uh, with a with a toy with a plastic little toy, you know, AK uh, forty seven kind of looking thing. And it was clearly a toy; it was tiny. Um, but uh, but everybody was uh, was upset. How could the parents be so careless to take their child to to the scene of a of a shooting many months ago uh, with a plastic toy gun? It's that kind of ridiculous attitude that, that really needs to be countered. And by having people engaged in uh, something that, that is not a firearm but is at least closely related to, you know, shooting sports, um, I, I think is actually helpful for us, for, for firearms in general and healthy as a society to get people used to firearms. Um, in terms of my push to get it legalised, uh, yeah, look, uh, it turns out uh, the Labor Party isn't going to do me any favours on that front. Um, I was able to put together a bit of a coalition with the Liberal Party and the Nationals and and crossbenchers, um, but the Labor Party was ultimately able to filibuster the effort, which is disappointing because they, they had indicated previously that they were willing to look at this in good faith, and then at the last minute they decided to filibuster it. But look, the reality is uh, they're under no obligation to implement uh, my policy. It's my policy. I'm the one that wants to legalise it. And if people want to see Airsoft legalised, well, they're going to have to elect more people like me. They're going to have to elect more Liberal Democrats uh, so we can see this thing through. So. Uh, look, it hangs in the balance. If I get re-elected, if more Lib, Dem get, Lib Dems get uh, elected, then we can have a look at this issue again. My initial attempt was to amend the Firearms Act and to regulate airsoft the same way that we regulate paintball. You know, you, you write it in, in in the definition and then the rest is left up to regs, and if the police do the right thing, they add it uh, under Category E like paintball is currently. It would be very, very, uh, you know, it would be wrapped up in so much red tape. But, look, you know, paintball does exist in WA. It's very expensive, but you can play it. So it would at least be a foot in the door. If I was given another opportunity and if we had the numbers to do it in our own right without having to build a, a coalition to, to get it through, uh, I'd like to look at how New South Wales has regulated their paintball recently. So they've moved paintball out of the Firearms Act and they now have it regulated by the New South Wales, Wales equivalent of their Department of Commerce uh, and Consumer Affairs. Uh, that's a fantastic way to do it. You know, paintball, airsoft, they're not firearms. 
uh, and they're, they're, they're really ideally shouldn't be regulated as such. And if you can get an, an agency other than police to regulate it, that'd be a win for everybody. It'd be a win for firearm owners. It'd be a win for those guys that want to play those skirmish sports. So, uh, you know, yeah, if, if, if I'm re-elected, if more Lib Dems are elected, uh, and it's certainly on our agenda, uh, and, and we'll see even if we can get it done with a with a lighter regulatory touch. What's um, what's the jail ball uh, laws over there? Obviously, uh, everywhere else around the show, it's uh, it's banned yeah. or heavily restricted. I think Queensland's the only one now where you can actually uh, use them in your back lawn. But yeah. like I had a couple hanging over my bar, and I was told that I'd be looking at a jail term if I had the two plastic broken guns hanging over my bar. But, um, but I can go and play with them in the backyard, but you've got to lock them away in a cupboard. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's just absolutely ridiculous. I've, I've been in the building trade for 30 years. I've built hundreds of houses and worked on hundreds of houses. I've never seen one house built with a lockable cupboard. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, – in WA, it's really confusing. Um, we seem to have gotten to the bottom of it. Uh, police consider them to be imitation firearms based on the latest advice I've got. Uh, so they're, they're not treating them as firearms. They're not treating them as just toys, which is how they really should treat them. Um, they're treating them as imitation firearms. And so there are some regulations around how those are handled. Uh, they don't need to be licensed like a firearm, but there are strict rules about um, uh, who can sell them. And uh, obviously it would be illegal to you know, brandish it in public and, and you know, cause fear. Um, so, so technically, uh, you should be able to use them. The problem is getting the police to admit that, you know, in any way that's that's tangible. Um, so, you know, they're they're very very reluctant to put that in writing anywhere. Um, there's some there's some case law uh, recently, I believe, that that backs up that position that they shouldn't be treated as anything more than imitation firearms. But that's not really going to protect you from the police kicking down your door and conducting a search of your house and maybe arresting you or, or confiscating your your toy plastic guns. Uh, so it's a really precarious situation right now. Um, you know, if you if you test it in court, you'd probably win, but it's hard to say. You know, the, who's got the money or the time to do this kind of stuff, right? Um, so, so you should be clear with with job all, but um, but but you're still in a bit of a grey area where the where the police are very reluctant to clarify the situation, uh, and and it's it's very annoying because this is no different, you know, really it's no different to like a Nerf gun. You know, you paint a Nerf gun black, who knows the difference between a plastic, you know, toy gun and and, and an imitation firearm, uh, and you can buy an imitation firearm from any pawn broker or military surplus store. You don't need a license to do that. You can buy resin replicas. You can buy replicas with you know, with, with what looks like a moving action. Um, you probably, I, I think the thumbnail for your video is like a photo of me with a with a replica AK, uh, you know, which has a has a moving bolt uh, and, it, and it looks like the real deal. Um, but, you know, you, you can buy that and you don't need a license, but as soon as it shoots a little plastic pellet or a little gel ball, uh, suddenly it's a big deal and it's nonsensical. It makes no sense and... Uh, you know, the, the result at the end of the day is, you know, police cracking down on kids that just want to play a skirmish sport. Um, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, look, if I, if I had it my way, um, I'd, I'd treat them like toys. But uh, if we're able to do something with Airsoft, um, you know, that, that might help the job all guys at the same time. It, it's certainly on our agenda too. Can you guys still hear me? Am I still coming through properly? Yeah, yeah. you've just come through. You, you're frozen Sorry. for a bit there. So, I, I know Aaron's been. I know Aaron, or actually the the host of the show, Aaron, not Aaron Stonehouse, uh, has been big on this all week. So we're not going to mention any names, Aaron. All right, so we're not going to mention any names. But you know, people are shooters are concerned that you know the deals pro shooting parties or pro freedom parties are doing with other parties that are either banning guns, opposing guns, uh, coming up saying that uh, you know gel blasters are in fact replica firearms and this sort of rubbish. So. What is the LDP doing with uh, any potential preference deals with other parties, especially ones that are, you know, basically uh, totally opposed to, to, to our way of thinking of leave us alone, we want to go about our business? Uh, is the uh, LDP doing deals with people like Labor or are they doing deals with the Greens or are they doing deals uh, where they think they're just going to be elected? So what's your, what's your thoughts on that one? Yeah, look, I, uh, I, I've seen some of the... Some of the drama unfolding on Facebook. Um, look, uh, uh, to begin with, I, I think um, 
think some people have got the wrong idea. Uh, there, there's been a real beat up of the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. And, and look, I'm, I'm not going to go into bat for, for that party. They're, at the end of the day, we're competing for votes with each other uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so they are, they are my political opponents. But I, I, I think some of the responses to them have been a bit unfair um, and, uh, and and a bit, a bit unwarranted. Um, look, uh, the reality is, you know, we have group voting tickets in Western Australia and you, you, you have to number every party. So somebody's going to be at the bottom, somebody's going to be second last, somebody's going to be third last. Generally, with minor parties, you know, it's left up to the party headquarters to negotiate those preferences and set the order. Um, but, you know, normally what you see with a lot of minor parties, um, uh, in the case of Lib Dems, you know, we put major parties at the bottom. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there are probably one or two exceptions. We do put the Socialist Party at, at the bottom below the major parties, but that that's that, that's really the only exception now. So minor parties always, uh, major parties always go at the bottom of the ticket. Because uh, you know the reality is, you know, between Liberal and Labor, I mean, they're, they're both just as bad as each other when it comes to firearms. You know, you can't really rely on either of them, I don't think. And 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 the Nationals too. Look, every now and then the Nationals will throw shooters a bone. Um, you know, they're not as bad as Liberal and Labor, but but at the same time, they're not. I, I don't think you can really rely on them all that much. But that's about as much as I'll say as other part for other parties. I mean, the Liberal Democrats. Uh, we're always going to have shooters backs. You know, you look at my voting record in WA Parliament, uh, I've consistently voted uh, for the rights of shooters. I've consistently opposed actions to, you know, increase licensing fees or to restrict firearm categories. Uh, you know, you look at um, my colleagues in Victoria, Tim Quilty, David Limbrick, they've done the same thing there in Victoria. And you look at uh, former Senator David Lionhelm, when he was in the Senate, he did the exact same thing. Uh, so you know, Lib Dems have a, have a pretty clear track record on firing issues. Um, we've always voted consistently. We've never shied away from it. Um, you know, and our, and our preferences, you know, I, I think reflect that. And look, you know, you, you don't need to vote above the line if you don't want to. Voters ultimately do have control. If they want to take the shortcut and they trust the party, they can vote above the line. If they want to set the preferences themselves and they maybe want to put the Greens below the Socialists, you know, for whatever reason, they can do that too, and they can number the boxes themselves. Um, you know, look, I think at the end of the day, you know, you vote for somebody and you elect them on a four-year term. And, um, you know, you've got to be sure that, you know, you trust them to carry out, you know, to, to, to have your interests at half for four years. I think if you can trust a party to have your interests at half for four years, you can probably trust the party with preferences. At the end of the day, you know, you know, uh, uh, the major parties, you've got to order them in some order. They're at the bottom, um, but you know, you, you, the idea is you're trying to get that minor party elected in the first instance, and hopefully that can happen, and you can get uh, you know more minority voices in parliament that are hopefully pro shooter, rather than relying on the good graces of uh, you know Mark McGowan to show mercy to firearm owners, which we know he's not going to do. Exactly. Well, here's a uh, a super chat question that will lead into my next question I've got for you, actually. So, JR, thank you for that. Thank you for everyone who's donated to the show tonight. I really do appreciate it, and we will bring your questions up to ask Aaron. If you bring up a super chat, we'll make sure we definitely do that. So uh, he asks, why is the government allowing police uh, to make policies and making um, and making their own laws? We elect politicians, not police. So now this goes into, uh, as you know, there's been about 14 gun bans in WA in the last 12 months. So what is actually going on? Is it uh, someone in the police force? Uh, trying to work their way up the food chain and try and get the top job or something like that, which to me I thought would be illegal because police are there to, to police the law, not make the law. Or is it just some Labour politician uh, who has just a pure hatred for gun owners and or, or something along those lines? No one actually knows because 14 guns in 12 months is unbelievable. It's just like one after the other and after the other. Some of them are Category C guns, which are highly restricted anyway. And I think two weeks ago, there was an air rifle, for God's sake. So, Doug, yeah. do, do you know what's going on there? Or is there any way that the politicians can step in and, and, and stop this? Mm -hmm. uh, these are the sort of questions that we're getting asked. Yeah, look, um, I, I don't want to speculate on the internal, you know, politics of the firearms branch. Um you know, suffice to say, there are some pretty good guys there uh, who who are doing the right thing, uh, and there and then there are, there are some people who are pretty ignorant and, and don't know the first thing about firearms. You know, 
they get an application for a firearm and, and they go Googling it and they say, say they see a scary picture of something with a pistol grip, you know, with, with a, with a Picatinny rail or something. And, and they, and they say, you know, denied, uh, based on a Google search result. That, that's the impression I get. But, um, look, uh, part of the problem is that the, the firearms act, um, the, if you read the actual act, it, it's, it's really slim. It's, it's as a, what it's what legislators call it skeletal. You know, it, it just lays out a sort of, the vague, you know, functions of how the licensing system works. It doesn't actually give you any of the details. The rest of it is left up to regulations, and uh, quite a lot of it uh, is actually left up to um, the commissioner's discretion, and he delegates that power to to the, to the officers in the firearms branch, and, and they have quite a lot of discretion. Now, you know, can, when it comes to administering some things, obviously, you know, you do need government um, employees to have some discretion, uh, you know, and hopefully they apply common sense, but becomes a problem when uh, when when there isn't like a clear, easy right of review. You know, you've got to take a lot of these cases to sat if you want to argue them, and then you bog down for months, it could cost you an arm and a leg, uh, and a lot of people are just going to see it not, not as worth their time or their money. Um, the solution to that is to uh, perhaps remove uh, some of the um, some of the delegated power in the act and to tighten things up and make them more specific. But then at the same time, that really opens Pandora's box. And you try to you try to rewrite the Firearms Act right now when you've got uh, you know, a very popular Labor government that is very anti-gun, uh, and we'll wait and see what the outcome of this coming election is. If if Labor has the balance of power, you really don't want to let let them have control of rewriting the Firearms Act. Um, so, so it's really really difficult, uh, and it's kind of on a knife's edge. You, you don't want to um, you don't want to make things worse. Um, you do need you do need politicians in place uh, who are pro firearm to fix this issue, uh, and you need enough of them. It's not just enough to have you know, myself or, or Shooters, Fishers, Farmers MP or, or some other party MP who's pro firearm, you need to have the balance of power. Uh, you need to have more of us in there. Um, and, th and that's ultimately, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just about lobbying. You've, you've got to get your guys elected. You've got to get enough of your guys elected to make a difference. So, uh, you know, th those, those who are shooters in WA, um, you know, I have this experience quite a lot. You know, people who are pro shooting and, as a as an MP trying to run an, an election campaign, you know we're calling around to people asking for volunteers, and a lot of people, oh, it's on a Saturday. Uh, I got too, I got something else on. You know, I'm going to a barbecue. Got more important things to do. Okay, fair enough. You know, not everybody has the time or the luxury to be involved in politics in that way. But if if you don't get involved in politics and you don't get your guys elected, your pro shooting guys, whether it's whether it's my team or somebody else's team. You can't really complain when, uh, when you know, when the police ban your firearms, or, or, when, or when the government imposes uh, restrictions on firearms. Because it's the only way you're going to get a change out of this. You can't rely on the good graces of a Labor premier. You can't rely on the good graces of uh, of the bureaucrats or the officers in the firearms branch. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely, definitely. One one thing I want to, I guess, there's a bit of a curveball. I know Aaron's not uh, uh, upset with a few little hard questions. You know, we've been promised. I've been doing this for about 10 years, you know, podcasting. Obviously, we did an interview back in 2017. I've done a lot of interviews with other pro-gun parties, people from the Nationals, and the problem comes down to people promising but never, ever delivering. You know, I, I really like David Lionhelm, what he was doing in Parliament. He had a few wins on uh, Anzac Rifle Range, for an example, but we've got other parties from around 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 different states as well promising us you know promising if you know if we get elected we're going to do this well you know again we are 25 years now after port arthur right we we don't have enough people in parliament the people that we do have i get are probably trying their best but at the end of the day i guess it comes down to what has actually been legislated by these pro gun parties and uh i'm looking back 10 years i've written thousands of letters to politicians that's never changed the law. I've written about suppressors, self-defense, uh, different types of firearms, gel blasters, public land hunting, just to name a few. And uh, there's some states around Australia, people say they're fighting for gun owners, but when you actually look at their, their legislation or what, either what they're introducing into parliament or, or their actual achievements, it's either 12 fifths of stuff or, or, or zero. So mm -hmm. what realistically can we actually do if we don't have a balance of power uh, uh, to actually achieve some of these actual firearms legislation. Because, again, every you know, I was there. I probably think a lot different than I thought, say, seven or eight years ago, where I thought, you know, sometimes politics was the way to go. And we just haven't had enough people be able to get in in 25 years. Will we ever get enough people? And if so, mm -hmm. 
we, we've got to live and die by the sword. Of, we, we need to make those relationships to actually get some sort of legislation through. Otherwise, again, it comes down to why are we voting for pro-gun people if, again, it's, it's promises but never delivering on those promises? Mm. Yeah, look, um, my my outlook on this has changed a lot as well uh, since since we first did that interview in 2017. Uh, you know, you learn a lot. You, you go into Parliament bright-eyed, you know, you, you think you're going to change everything, and then you realise the reality of it uh, and, and just the, the simple... Uh, the simple, you know, uh, math, you know, that you need you need a majority to pass anything. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll push back a little bit. You know, the, you know, what, are, you know, I get this question sometimes. I've had it, I've had it before, you know, well, what have you done for firearm owners, you know, in your four years? Um, well, uh, very little, to be honest. And, and that's all I can do. I, the only power I have uh, to do anything is the power that voters give me. And if, uh, if voters are only going to elect me on my own, um, you know, to, as a representative of my party, and they're only going to elect, you know, one or two other pro-shooting MPs, then that's all we can, that's all we can do. Uh, we, we only have the power that people give us and that people entrust with us. And so, you know, look, yeah, if, if I've got the numbers, I'll introduce all kinds of things. You know, if I can build a uh, consensus in parliament, if I can work with other pro-shooting parties, and I certainly do, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that stuff whenever I can, but I can only do it if I'm enabled to do it by, uh, by you know, by shooters, by voters. So, you know, I get it's easy to look and go, you know, oh, this guy says that, you know, pro-shooting, this MP, you know, never did this or never did that. Yeah, but the, if they're only one or two MPs or three or four, they can't do it anyway. Um, you know, maybe that's a problem that people overpromise. Um, you know, uh, they promise things that they can't deliver. I mean, the language of politics is, is kind of, you know, if you elect out, you know, if you elect enough of us, we'll implement this. This is our plan. And, you know, if you buy into that plan, you'll elect us and we'll implement our plan. It's a little bit different with minor parties because we're very, it's very unlikely that we'll be in a position to implement everything that we want. We'll have to build, you know, alliances and coalitions, of course. And so we try to be realistic about the promises that we make. And we say, look, if we're on the crossbench, we'll fight for this. And this is our policy and we'll try to get this done. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, if, if only I get elected or if one of my colleagues gets elected and that's it, uh, then, you know, yeah, that's all we can do. You know, the last four years with firearms, most of it's just been putting out fires, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to put down, uh, you know, stupid ideas that Labor implements or, uh, or um, pressuring ministers uh, to get them to reverse some rubbish policy that the police have implemented. You know, some examples might be um, the firearm transport policy that police implemented that made it virtually impossible to transport a firearm in Western Australia. It made uh, Australia Post drop firearm transport entirely across the state. Um, you know, and, and then we had to defend. We had to go, we had to react to that. Uh, you know, we had a handgun storage policy. We had to react and try to defend firearm owners. We had, um, we had this, the closure of uh, gun stores at the height of the pandemic, and we had to react to that and defend the rights of firearm owners. And, all this time we're reacting, we're defending, and we're on the defensive, just trying to put up barriers and stop whatever the next uh, stupid idea is, um, because we've never had the numbers to to go on the offensive and implement our own firearms agenda. We're really just trying to stop, you know, Labor's firearm agenda or Liberal's firearm agenda, and um, and yeah, it really does fall back on on voters. You know, uh, if there's not enough uh, firearm voters out there, um, then then that's the reality. But you know, what I find the problem is quite often is, you know, there are certainly a lot of people who are pro-firearm. Um, I can't remember if there are hundreds of thousands of firearm owners in West Australia. Uh, are they voting on that issue? You know, are they voting with their feet? Are they are they firearm owner, but they still vote liberal or national? Well, then that's the problem. You know, you've got to make the switch. You've got to switch from those major parties that don't do anything for you to the minor parties that, you know, that uh, that are a little bit hungrier, maybe a little more gutsy, and are willing to uh, are willing to go and bat for motors. Because if you're not willing to make the switch, you keep getting the same deal. Um, you look at how organised firearm owners are in uh, you know the United States. You know and how influential they can be, and it's not necessarily that they spend a lot of money, but that that they are incredibly organised and incredibly vocal. They're very disciplined. Um, and here in WA, uh, I get the impression that. Um, you know, firearm owners sometimes, you know, there, there are some that are very passionate and they're willing to get involved in politics, but there are others who just kind of go with the flow and, and they're not really thinking about, you know, what party they're a member of, what party they volunteer for, what party they donate to. 
uh, and, and if firearms are important to them, they really, know, really need to be, to be thinking in those terms. Mm. But at least let me say one thing too. It's good that you actually say that on what you can realistically achieve and not just tell us what we want to hear. I find that a little bit refreshing because, uh, you know, possibly even, I'll, I'll say it honestly, probably to some, maybe to the detriment of your, of your re-election chances. I hope you get re-elected, of course, absolutely. But, you know, it's good to see at least the, the LDP. And I saw a post from Tim Quilty just last week on duck hunting, uh, realistically about what he could actually achieve and him not wanting to spur the government on just in case they either A, banned it entirely or B, you know, uh, stop duck hunting. There was no, have no season for that year. And again, potentially at the detriment to him being re-elected. But I find you guys, I guess, the 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 unlikely politician, so to speak, is in the fact that you guys just tell the truth because you're not really, yeah, you know, as the as the as the Trump supporters say, like basically part of the swamp. You'll tell us how it is, and that's what we actually appreciate. Whether you know, and again, I'm not going to mention any names, but there's parties out there that are telling us we're going to do this. We have a track record on firearms. But then when you actually look at over, say, 40 or 50 years, what legislation they've actually put in front of parliament, and the answer is zero. The answer is zero. Yet telling me they're going to fight for my interests. It's okay to be on TV and say these things, but it comes down to tangible results. And I guess shooters after, well, you'd probably say almost 25 years since Port Arthur are just are sick of waking up every morning to a new gun ban or to things like gel blasters uh, being... <laughs> classified as actual firearms. I mean, people around the world, Aaron, are literally laughing at Australia as a laughing stock amongst the world uh, that that we're banning a, a, a toy, which on the box says, you know, seven years and up, that shoots little gel balls, which you put water in. Like, I mean, what has happened to the government? What has happened to Labor and Liberal? I see uh, Labor these days as being far left with the Greens. And to be honest, when the Liberal Party, I mean, centre, maybe I would probably say left of centre, maybe their economic policy is better than Labor, but really it's the same party. And will Labor, will, will they really do anything different? Because at the end of the day, they're courting the same votes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think you can, uh, you know, if you keep voting for the same parties, you're going to keep getting the same results, right? Uh, you know, if you keep voting major parties, you know, there, there's you, you can't expect a different outcome. Um, people need to vote with their feet. They need to vote with their wallet. Uh, they, they need to get they, they need to get angry, and they need to uh, you know start making this the issue that they vote on, um, rather than just you know um, I don't know uh, you know one of many issues. Um, you know if they, if, they, if they don't vote with their feet, they're, they're not going to see a change. Yeah. Yep. Hey, you, hey Aaron, uh, you got any more questions? Maybe we'll, maybe yeah. sift through and get some questions from yep. some people in the chat, giving them opportunity to. Uh, to, to ask a few definitely. questions, we'll uh, maybe another okay. 20 minutes, okay. Aaron, got a few. Yeah. We'll yeah. maybe give you another yeah. 20 minutes or so and then a couple, couple yeah. of questions for some Q&A and then, guys, ask your questions, yeah. Okay, a couple of quick ones here. Uh, Falcrum, will David Linehound run in New South Wales again? Do you talk to him at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, stay close with David Linehound. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, I think he's, I think he's enjoying his retirement from politics. Um, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a pretty stressful job. Uh, he uh, would he run in New South Wales? I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I have a lot of respect for the guy. Uh, I think he built up a, a pretty good following. There's a lot of people that joined the party um, because of him, and uh, he he put the, the party on the map. It's it's why I joined. Uh, he's the one who um, recruited me to run as a candidate in uh, in the West Australian election in 2017. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. Look, it's up to him. Uh, he he doesn't need to be a politician. He doesn't particularly want to be. Uh, he uh, you know he runs a very successful business. He owns a farm. Uh, he has a he has a nice relaxing life outside of politics. So who who knows? Maybe he's a maybe he's a sucker for punishment, and, and he can be talked into it. I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Exactly, exactly. And uh, Jeff, um, he's from WA as well. Um, Will it ever be public land hunting in WA? What can we do to get the ball rolling? Yeah, look, I, I think there are. Uh, I think there could be. Um, you know, being careful not to overpromise again. Uh, it, it is. It is possible. Um, there was a private members' bill introduced uh, by the Shooters, Fishers, and Farmers Party um, just uh, last year, and and I, and I voted for it. Of course, I supported it, um, but. Uh, Unfortunately, at that time, there, there weren't the numbers, you know, so, so we, 
it was introduced and the idea was broached, but it didn't really go anywhere. It was a bit like, you know, the Airsoft um, thing. It, it, it didn't get to a um, substantive vote. Uh, it's possible because they have hunting on public land already uh, in WA. It is already done. It's just administered by, if I can remember correctly, uh, it's administered by, I think, the Department of... Um, See the Department of uh, Bioconservation and something, um, or it's a uh, uh, park. So they do it together in combination. Um, so they already do it to some extent. It's just it's not really widespread, um, and it's not that accessible. It's done on a case by case basis. It would be great to see it implemented uh, across the entire state and to see it promoted as a healthy activity, not just for conservation, but as something that is good for people's mental health and for their uh, and for their physical health to get them out and active and, and reconnected with, uh, you know, with, with the natural environment, with the bush. It's, it does wonders for your mental health to do that. Um, so, yeah, it is possible because other states have it and we already do it here in WA just on a very limited scale. Uh, and uh, we could see it expanded uh, and adopted wide scale in WA. Um, and it's something that I'll continue to push for uh, if, if, you know, if I'm lucky enough to be reelected. Oh, good stuff. And uh, Carlton, I know he's from WA. Uh, Mr Stonehouse, what can and will you do about changing the stigma about firearms? You talk about electing people with our views, but what about changing current politicians' minds? Um, <laughs> firearms are a tool. Yes, that's something that I was going to ask you about. Do you, don't have to name anyone, but are there other politicians in WA that you deal with, talk to, uh, have firearms licenses, but they won't come out publicly and talk about it because, as we all know, hate to say it, uh, talking about guns is not a good way of getting um, re-elected and they want to just uh, pretty much just push the guns aside and so they can keep collecting their big fat paychecks and ignore their sport. Uh, do you find that at all? Uh, yeah, there there actually are uh, a few firearm owners in, in Parliament. Um I don't know if they have a license or not, um, but there there are there are quite a few shooters and people who enjoy shooting. Uh, there, now the problem isn't so much convincing the those MPs uh, that shooting is is a you know legitimate and, and, and healthy activity. Um, I think it's probably more about convincing the public and the media um, because a lot of these politicians, you know, they're they're they may be they're self serving, but it's kind of what the job does to you. You know, like you you're not. You know, if, you, if, if you're a politician that takes unpopular positions all the time, you, you know, you're probably not going to stick around for very long, right? And I think a lot of these mainstream um, parties and politicians understand that, and that's why they, they're quiet about firearms, even if they are shooters themselves, or they, they're they very careful about what they say. Um, so uh, so I think a lot, of these, a lot of these guys who are pro-shooting but are quiet about it, um, it's, it's not so much about convincing them to be, you know, loud about it. It's probably about changing perceptions in the wider society uh, and, and also in the media. You know, if these guys thought that if they talked about firearms, they weren't going to get hammered by the media, that would, that, that would get them to talk about firearms rather than, um, you know, their own perception of, uh, for, of, of the suitability of firearm, you know, shooting as a sport. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of like a cultural battle. You know, the, the, the politics of this is downstream of uh, culture. And so uh, if attitudes towards firearms can be changed in society, uh, then uh, then the politicians will follow because uh, they're going to go wherever the votes are, right? So <laughs> if, uh, if these guys think that there's votes in standing up for the rights of firearm owners, then they will. Um, uh, and, and, and that's how you can change that kind of stuff. But... That's a that's a much harder fight, you know. That ch changing changing uh, society's perception of firearms is um that's a long term game. It'd be much easier to just uh, elect uh, elect a few more crossbenchers, um, so we had the balance of power, and we could probably start to get some wins instead. Uh, probably probably easier than uh, influencing uh, you know the entire society. Uh, just one second, I need to check, Aaron. Just check that private chat for me for a sec, will you? Need to get rid of someone. You need to get rid of someone. Okay. Yeah, sorry, we get this from time to time. Uh, here's another one for you to answer. Um, is Mr. Stonehouse the NSC member? Um, and uh, DJ Coops is going to vote for you. Uh, we did uh, talk about yeah. that before. Thanks, DJ Coops. Uh, yeah, you, I think you mentioned it in the intro. Uh, I am, yeah. Uh, so uh, I uh, yeah, joined up, um, I think, a few weeks ago. Uh, our MP in uh, Victoria is a member of the NSC. Uh, the NSC showed up on my radar and uh, 
someone asked me if I'd like to join, and I thought, yeah, why the hell not? Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the SSAA. Um, I might be an honorary member of some other some other club. I, uh, so yeah, look, the more the merrier. Happy to join uh, any group that's that's willing to invite me. And um, you know, I think uh, I think it's great. You know, I think the SSA does a good job, but there there's always room for more organisations. You know, we're all on the same side at the end of the day. And uh, you know, if there's more people in there advocating for the rights of firearm owners and and educating the public, uh, certainly a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So. Here's a question I've got. Um, self-defense, where do you stand on that? A lot of people, uh, gun owners, are big on self-defense. They think it's the right to defend uh, our friend, our family and ourselves if we're broken into our own home. I'm not, a lot of people construed it as in uh, oh, carrying guns everywhere you go, but basically uh, the start would be in your own home, wouldn't it? Yeah, look, um, I, I'm a big advocate of uh, everybody's right to defend themselves and their own property as well. You know, um, as, a, as, as someone who believes in, uh, in freedom and in natural rights, the most important right is the right to private property, the right to, you know, to, to protect yourself and your family, your loved ones, and, and what you've earned and what you've worked hard for. Uh, in fact, I, um, I uh, managed to trigger a review of... Um, of uh, self-defense in WA Parliament, uh, I had a motion uh, about uh, pepper spray. Uh, in Western Australia, you can buy pepper spray over the counter, and uh, it's one of the few states where you can do that, and you can actually have it with you uh, if you have a, uh, I've got to remember the wording of the Weapons Act now, it's something along the lines of, you can. Ha it's a defense, if you have it uh, for a, um, uh, for, for a legitimate, uh, you know, uh, need, if you think that a legitimate need may arise or something like that, some some legal technical wording. So you, you can have it for self-defense. The problem is that the police, if they catch you with it, their idea of what a legitimate self-defense need is is very different to what you or I might think a legitimate need is. And so what's happened is um, people have uh, had it. There was one case a few years ago of a pregnant woman walking to catch the bus to work, I think it was, uh, you know, four in the morning, and she had pepper spray in her purse, and she got charged with a, with a, with a, with a weapons charge for that. Um, I, had a, I had a woman come to see me a couple of years ago. Uh, she was the victim of a stalker, and she bought some pepper spray, and the stalker uh, confronted her in a restaurant, uh, you know, making all kinds of, of lewd, you know, horrible, you know, sort of um, sexual innuendo at her, and uh, so she gave him a little spray of the pepper spray, and he he took off. Uh, and uh, and she ended up getting charged with a weapons charge and with uh, aggravated assault um, because it turns out this guy was over sixty. Now uh, she had a restraining order against him, but the restraining order had lapsed because she travelled to America uh, where she was an academic, and she'd come back to Australia and didn't realise the restraining order lapsed, and and then. You know this whole ordeal happened, and she ended up with these charges on her uh, uh, against her file. Now they ended up um, they ended up dropping her charges eventually, um, luckily. But that that she had to go through that whole ordeal and hire a lawyer to defend herself was ridiculous. So I, I managed to um, bring that that issue up, and we debated it. And I actually managed to get uh, everybody to agree with me that uh, at the very least, vulnerable people like like women or the elderly should have access to a practical means of self defense in this case, uh, pepper spray, and we got a review. Unfortunately, the review went to the police, and the police came back and said, yeah, no problem with the law. It's fine as it is. It's okay to charge women who are the victims of stalkers uh, with assault and weapons breaches uh, for having pepper spray. But um, uh, back to your initial question, sorry. Uh, no, big fan of uh, self-defense. I, I think we absolutely need to have some, something, some equivalent of castle doctrine in this country. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that you know, if you're roused from your sleep by somebody breaking in through, you know, your your daughter's window, uh, that you have to be the one who exercises restraint and you have to be the one who has to be careful that you don't use un unreasonable force. At that moment in time, you don't know what that attacker's intentions are. You, you don't know what is reasonable and what is unreasonable and the onus shouldn't be on you to exercise restraint in that instance. You should just be worried about protecting your family and yourself. Um, so I, I think our self-defense laws in general need a complete overhaul, and uh, and it also, I mean, look, if I was if I was dictator for a day, I, I would I would certainly like to see the Firearms Act reflect that as well. You know, 
we saw that case, uh, I can't remember where it was, New South Wales and Victoria, where a guy had, a, had somebody having some kind of episode at his back door, um, you know, and, and this guy, you know, got his gun out and, and got the guy to calm down and then drove him to the police station and the police took the guy's firearms off. And we all know that case, right? Um, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Obviously, we don't want people walking around like it's the Wild West, you know, and, and, and shooting down people in the street. But, but the idea that, you know, you have a tool at home, available to you that may be suitable in those circumstances, uh, you shouldn't be punished for using it if it's appropriate. If you use it inappropriately, that's another matter, of course. But, uh, you know, people need to have legal protection and some certainty that if they're defending themselves and their loved ones, that they're not going to find themselves on the wrong end of the law. Um, I've tried to do a little bit of work on that already, uh, and I'll continue to try to, to, try to, uh, to, try to get those laws fixed around self-defense at the very least. It's interesting, just a very quick one before we get some more questions for people. I mean, you know, the government always says, well, they've got all these programs. You see advertisements on TV, you know, domestic violence is bad, which, of course, we know it is. Um, you know, but then, then when people actually put real-world examples in there, the things we can actually do, so even like pepper spray, even non-lethal forms of self-defence, oh, Labor and Liberal go, nah, 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 we're not doing that. Uh, and, uh, are we serious about actually stopping crime? I mean, we can't just throw pixie dust up in the air and say, uh, you know, men will stop raping and, and and women will stop killing their husbands and vice versa. I mean, it's not really reality. So when they talk about having real-world ideas and examples of what they actually want to do, it really has no substance because when it actually comes down to it, they really don't want you know people to defend themselves. All the while, when they're in Parliament House or the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister, all have people with guns defending them, but yet guns are so awfully bad. Yeah, that's it. That's absolutely hypocrisy, isn't it? Uh, you know, politicians here in WA, they get the Dignitary Protection Unit. Premier walks around with a bunch of guys in black suits with earpieces and uh, and concealed firearms to protect him. So does the leader of the opposition. Um, I'm not quite important enough to get <laughs> a Dignitary Protection uh, Unit officer for myself. But uh, you know, but but then if you're a, if you're a, a, a woman walking to a car late at night or you're an elderly person uh, at home alone, uh, you know, you have to you have to rely on the police arriving five minutes too late. Uh, you know, you, you don't get that level of protection. Uh, and, and that's absolutely tragic. You know, uh, we all, we all, you know, we all have sisters, mothers, daughters, girlfriends, wives, spouses, uh, and it is worrying. You know, there are bad guys out there, absolutely. And it's all good and well to, you know, educate people and try to, you know, promote respect. Um, but there will always be that element of those bad guys who aren't going to listen to that, who are going to prey on the vulnerable. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to know that the people I care about at least have something that might tip the scales in their favour, you know, at least something that might help them disengage, uh, you know, and, and break away from an attacker and get, and, and get to safety. Um, and it's really sad to see that uh, in this case, I, I was able, when it came to pepper spray, I was able to get Labor and Greens and Liberal to agree with me, at least to the review of pepper spray. Um, but then it went to the police and the police said, no, uh, the police weren't interested in it. So in this case, you know, there was at least some political will to look at the issue, but, but the cops weren't interested. And, and that was and really disappointing. I think one second, when, when, when are the government, the government actually going to start standing up to the police and start saying, no, you guys are here to enforce the law not make the law. Again, they always seem to be consulted on everything. I mean, we, you can see what's happening in Victoria now, the things they're doing and, you know, all the while they've got BLM rallies, anti-Australia Day rallies, uh, uh, the Australian Open, and uh, all of a sudden a five-day lockdown, the police have got, uh, you know, their feet on people's throats, mate. You know, all the while they've got all these other things going on. I mean, it's just it's just unbelievable. Police need to start getting their hole and stay in their lane and governments, including, you know, police ministers, need to start laying down the law to these police committees and saying, Mate, enough's enough. I run the show here. You can advise me, but at the end of the day, I'm the minister. I I, I say what goes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a huge problem. You know, um, in Australia, we have this doctrine of uh, responsible government, you know, where the minister sits in parliament. And if I've got a problem, or if you've got a problem with what the government's doing, I, on your behalf, can get in there at question time and I can berate them with questions. I, I, I can tear them a new one verbally, you know. Uh, because the minister is the one responsible for what their agency does. With police, it's a bit different. Um, you know, the commissioner is independent. And, and, and when it comes to operational matters, you know, the, the minister doesn't interfere. Now, I can understand why they set it up that way. You know, they don't want 
you know, political corruption bleeding through to the police force. You know, you don't want the police minister to have an issue with somebody and say, you know what, send the cops around to hassle that guy. Uh, but, you know, that separation, that independence is good, but only to a point. You know, when, when there's no accountability with the operational stuff that police carry out, there's no accountability to the minister and to the parliament and by extension to the people, uh, then, then we've got a serious problem. You know, the, the parliament is there to represent the people and to hold the government accountable. That's what I'm there to do. It's what it's what other parliamentarians are there to do. But if if the commissioner doesn't have to answer to the to the to the minister on operational matters at all, uh, then then that that really uh, undermines uh, you know that that accountability and that responsible government. Um, and it's a shame. Uh, you know there there needs to be I think um, a, a, a rebalance, a shifting of that of that power back a little bit. You know. Yeah, it will open the risk of uh, perhaps corruption. That risk is always going to be there anyway, whether it's a minister or a corrupt cop, that there's always that risk. But you've got to have the accountability. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's, it's a technical... Needs, I was going to say the government needs to set the direction of what the police force is actually doing and not vice versa. We're seeing it, you know, in all, in all states. But, you know, that definitely needs to be pulled back. It's, it is getting out of control, the things they can decide on. I mean, at the end of the day, it's our taxpayers and, and, and we decide, you know, <laughs> how that money should be used. And like what we're seeing in Victoria, these people, the thing of the law under themselves and the things they can do against the people of this country. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's getting a sad state of affairs. But one sec, Aaron, do you want to grab some, maybe one question for Aaron from the group just so we can, yeah. um, he's probably got to go on his way soon, man, very quickly. So just grab grab a good question there and see, uh, yeah, this is a good one. Well, here's one uh, that you probably bring up in, in Parliament. Um, why do we have appearance laws um, when it is uh, to be carried out of sight of the public anyway? anyway? So the only people who are going to see these guns are the gun owners. And if you're that weak-minded, you're scared by another gun and you're a gun owner, maybe you should go hand your guns in because you know, shooting's not for the weak-minded. Yeah, it, it's really ridiculous. Uh you know, my approach to firearm legislation is, um, uh, you know, obviously my starting point is I think everybody has a right to defend themselves. Um, but, uh, but you know, firearm legislation and regulations should be based on, uh, you know, uh, public safety, right? So if, if you can justify a regulation on the grounds of public safety, then it may have merit, and then you can, you know, debate the finer details. So, you know, uh, a restriction on, um, you know, uh, uh, who can get a firearm, uh, you know, and background checks, that makes sense, makes absolute sense. A restriction on uh, appearance makes no sense at all. It, it has no benefit to public safety. And a lot of people will say, well, this is because the police, you know, don't want to have somebody walking around with something that looks like an AR-15 uh, when it's actually really just a, you know, a, a, a Cat A, you know, 22, you know, with some nice furniture on it that, that you know, the box magazine or something. Like the, but the, the problem there is, you know, an assumption that police are going to react differently based on, on, on the type of firearm. I mean, that's ridiculous. You really think like TRG is going to say, oh, hang on a second, you know, what did, what did the gun look like? You know, was it semi-auto? Uh, what was the magazine capacity? No, they're going to they're gonna go out and they're going to exercise caution regardless. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, when I was in New Zealand, I got to meet with the Assistant Police Commissioner uh, of New Zealand, uh, and they have a national police force. They don't have a federal police or state police. It's just national police that covers the entire country. Uh, and I asked them then um, a couple of interesting questions about how New Zealand's firearm legislation is different to Australia's. I asked them about the lack of a long arm register at the time. Um, and they said, well, you know, it doesn't really matter because if we're responding to uh, to a call, you know, we exercise maximum caution anyway. You know, so so whether or not the person has a shotgun in, in, the, in the firearms cabinet or not, it doesn't matter. The police response is going to be more or less the same, uh, which was interesting. Uh, I asked them about, you know, what about, you know, you've got all this airsoft here. Uh, aren't you worried that, uh, you know, somebody's going to go brandishing, you know, something that looks like a firearm when it's really just a plastic toy? Uh, and their response was, well, you know, anything can look like a firearm. You know, you could get a toy gun and it looks like a firearm and you can hold up a store with that. You could take a piece of wood and paint it black and it looks like a real gun and you can hold up a store with that. Uh, this obsession with appearance seems to be almost a uniquely Australian thing uh, it doesn't seem to have carried over, at least when I was in New Zealand, it wasn't, it wasn't evident there. It wasn't in place there. Uh, the police there seem to be much more sensible. Obviously, things have changed a little bit in the last couple of years in New Zealand, but um, at that time, they seemed pretty, pretty switched on. Um, yeah, it, make, it makes no difference to public safety. Uh, you know, 
it, it just seems to be there for, I don't know, uh, bureaucrats to justify their paycheck. You know, the more regulations uh, and the more they tinker with things, the more the more forms and hassle and red tape they tangle people up with, the more they can justify more full-time employees in a government agency, I suppose. Uh, and it's really disappointing. Um, it makes no difference to public safety at all. You know, you could have, uh, you could have a wood furniture uh, SKS, or you could have another semi-auto, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, rifle uh, that has a pistol grip. Uh, you know that that round is still going to do the same amount of damage. Uh, you know that the, that they're still just as dangerous as each other. And, and indeed, anybody who knows what they're doing could cause a lot of mayhem with a you know a bolt action or a, or a break action shotgun. It's just like the argument of you know lever action shotguns uh, and uh, break action double barrel shotguns. You know those guys that know how to reload a double. Uh, double barrel break action shotgun can reload those things a hell of a lot faster than somebody reloading a lever action uh, with a tube magazine. And, uh, you know, so restricting one type uh, or being more lenient or more strict with one type over another makes absolutely no difference to public safety. I don't feel any safer knowing that the police have banned a, uh, a rifle because it has plastic furniture rather than wood furniture. Uh, I would feel a lot safer if the police focused their energy on tracking down, you know, stolen firearms. You know, or if the police targeted their energy on ensuring that those with a criminal, um, with, a, with a history of violent crime or of, uh, you know, severe mental illness or, uh, or uh, you know, don't get firearms or tracking down, you know, when somebody passes away and their firearms just disappear into thin air, you know, find out what actually happened to those. I mean, that would make me feel safer uh, than, you know, arbitrary or silly, uh, you know, restrictions based on appearance. I mean, even then, just before you go, I've got a couple of quick ones. I mean, even, you know, supp- I don't know how suppressors haven't been legalised in Australia. I mean, you go to New Zealand, you go to England, a lot of parts of Europe, it's requested by farmers. Uh, you know, th- there's the normal things you can buy off the shelf uh, uh, with, with, as far as I'm aware, without a licence. So, uh, again, these are things we should have in the, in the country. Like, they should be basic. I mean, they're already complaining, you might have seen in Queensland, about uh, range noise. I mean, what, again, if you can have half your shooters, three-quarter your shooters using suppressor, makes total sense because you're going to get a lot less noise, a lot less noise in the bush, a lot less game scare. But I guess my two questions, I guess these are very, very simple ones, uh, more sort of yes or no. A, will Labor be be, uh, re-elected in in WA? And B, will you be re-elected in WA? Uh, Labor definitely will be. Uh, I think that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, Will I or any of the guys who are part of my team and the Lib Dem team, Look, we'll have to wait and see. You know, we'll be working hard. Uh, you know, hopefully that pays off. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, give him a thumbs uh, up before we send him off, Aaron. Just give one, give a thumbs up to say that you like the stream. And uh, what did you want to add, Aaron? Yeah. Um, well, we got we had a few more questions from people, but we do want to apologise. We couldn't get to them all. Maybe uh, once the election's over, if you'd like to come back, you are more than welcome to come back, Aaron. Sure. More than welcome. Yeah. And, uh, we can talk about. We can talk a bit more about the pistol shooting and that. Um, but, yes, definitely give us thumbs up. And if you're in WA, please have a look on the on March the 13th for the election and uh, give Aaron your vote if you are able to, which would be very good. Seems to be the only uh, politician. that doesn't seem to be like a, a career politician. This is the thing I was going to ask you. Do you think there should be fixed terms? Like we got um, a certain politician here in Queensland who um, has been here for 50 years sucking off taxpayers, uh, just a complete leech, and achieved absolutely nothing. So would you like to see fixed terms? Would it bring these people in line? Um, I know it'll make the public feel a lot better because uh, they just don't see um, your taxpayers' money just being flushed down the toilet by someone who cares about a dirt road. Yeah, look, um, it's, it's an interesting idea. I'm not so sure I, I agree with it. Yeah, you do get lazy politicians who just suck off the, you know, the, the taxpayers' teat. Um, but uh, but they're not. They're a result of party politics. You know, when when a seat is always going to vote Liberal or always going to vote Labor, it doesn't matter who's in that seat. They're just there keeping a seat warm. You know, for the for the party. And, and, and does it matter if you shuffle that person around every four years or every eight years? It's probably going to be the same. But at the same time, you do sometimes get really good uh, really good MPs and, and, and people who are genuinely liked by their constituents. I mean, um, Bob Catter, I mean, you know, look, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a real character. Um, 
you know, uh, I don't agree with uh, with everything he says, but, um, you know, there's a guy who seems to be at least genuinely liked by his constituents, and I'm sure the people that keep voting for him would love to see him continue uh, in Parliament, right? Uh, and it would probably be a shame for, for his voters and his supporters if he was kicked out after four or eight years. Um, you know, what I think would work better is if uh, is if politicians' pay uh, was was frozen until uh, until public debt was paid off. Uh, I think that would be a good one. I think if uh, if if you know national debt and state debt was tied to MPs' salaries, uh, you would have balanced budget very very quickly. Uh, you know, you provide politicians with a financial incentive to make sure that they live within their means and that they don't tax people. Uh, you know, to breaking point. But um, I got a few other ideas about how we can fix up democracy, but that'll probably have to wait for another time. I think uh, I think what Aaron's trying to say is, I guess, people being politicians being accountable to the constituency and you know getting results based on you know people that are voting for them. I guess they're expecting that's what they're voting for. If they vote for a person, they are expecting you know a, a better deal for wherever their constituency is, whether it's yeah federal, whether it's state, whether it's a local area, doesn't matter what it is. People are putting trust in that person to actually get some you know, results based on their vote. But anyway, good stuff. Uh, it was good yes. chat. Definitely. Thanks, guys. Go Catch you guys next time. Stick, stick around because we're still going to be here. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much for coming on tonight, Aaron. I really appreciate it. And good luck on the 13th of March and hope it all goes really well for you. And we will talk to you um, probably after that. It'll be really good. And thank you for Looking giving forward. up your time. I know you're very busy. Really do appreciate it. Thank, thank you Thanks, very much. Thank you, Jason. Take care. See ya. Okay, that was good. What a, what a, yeah, extremely nice guy. Uh, no bullshit, spoke the truth. That, that's fantastic. I just wish other politicians were like him. Actually, um, yeah, had morals and stood up and, um, and and spoke what they actually mean. Yeah, yeah, I hope people liked it. Um, I mean, this was obviously organised by you, Aaron. Aaron actually organised all this, um, so... You know, good on him for wanting to get somebody on the show just to have a chat and tell us about what they actually believe in and and and, and hopefully what they're going to do. Yeah, it's a long, tough road, isn't it? Just It, it sort of brings it to the forefront, doesn't it, how it's going to be a long, long, tough road uh, for shooters and whether we have any success on that long, tough road, well, that's, yeah, that's yet to be seen. I mean, it's been a tough 10 years since I've been doing the show. I know you since probably eight years since you've been doing your show. And uh, I just hope it gets better sometime soon. But, yeah, what really probably drove it home during that conversation, I saw a lot of people commenting uh, about it in the, in the comments, was, yeah, the police having too much power and basically the politicians just bowing down to the, the authorities and the police, which is, is kind of scary. Um, and it sort of brings it to the forefront of, about how much the power the police actually have and by the decisions they make. So, no, nah, we're, nah, we're not having that. And the, the politician or the police minister just buckles. So... Uh, let us know in the comments what you guys thought about that. Um, hopefully, we asked a few hard questions. Hopefully, Aaron did. Hopefully, I did. And uh, you know, basically, what, you know, what's your thoughts on it in the comments? Leave, you know, give us a thumbs up if you liked it as well. There's a lot of people in the chat right now, so yeah, give us a thumbs up. Let's get it over 150 at least before the end of the show. We've got 20 minutes to go, but maybe we'll uh, put your questions up on the screen or what you thought of that interview. Would yeah, if you're from WA, would you be voting for him? Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the super chat. Um, re appreciate it. And there was another one down here. I'm very sorry if I did miss some of your your uh, super chats because uh, we had limited time tonight with with um, Aaron Stonehouse. So I was trying to get through them. It's just really hard. We've had, once again, hundreds of comments and questions. And JR, we did answer the uh, suppressor. Uh, why can't we get it reclassified exactly? That would be one of the – you'd think that would be one of the most uh, – simplest and logical things to get past would be suppressors because it's a no-brainer. There's so many studies out there that shows how um, beneficial it is to to your hearing and um, and people around you, that the science is there. They keep telling us, trust the science. I'll trust the science for, for this then and, yeah. uh, and do the right thing. If I had to pick one now, man, that would be my number one right now. Uh, appearance laws probably be, would be one and uh, suppressors that would probably be my one and two interchangeable. If I probably had to pick one, you know, if it's all of Australia, I'd probably say suppressors for all for all shooters across the country. So not just 
you know, um, contract shooters, you know, again, we can all talk about, you know, contract shooters and that getting suppressors, but to the grand scheme of things, that affects less than 0.1% of the shooters in this country. You know, we want to get suppressors for all shooters. So while that might be a win to get it for, say, contract shooters or or government officials or professional pest controllers, again, that's 0.1%. Most shooters sort of don't give a damn about that sort of stuff. What they care about is the majority of shooters getting access to suppressors, which we should be. Yep, exactly, exactly. Well, here's one. Um, uh, GK, suppressor or pillow? Well, I'd go the suppressor because pillows are too damn big to carry around. Won't fit in my range bag. I mean, how do we not have suppressors yet when it's as simple as off-the-shelf buying like in New Zealand, same as same as England? Man, Steve Balakas is going off here. He goes, <laughs> where's the first one? Let me just scroll up a bit. It's here somewhere. Um, vote one, the Aaron and Jace party. I don't know. wouldn't go that far, man. Um, the Shooting Stuff Australia party. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I could not be a politician because in uh, Parliament, I don't think I could hold my tongue when I get um, – People out there just start blabbing on, especially if I saw uh, someone who's just falling asleep in Parliament, how we all see it in the, on the news and that. I couldn't hold my tongue. I'd have to go there around, go there and give them a bit of a clip around the ears to uh, wake them up. You can imagine, you can imagine the chair would be evicting Aaron from the chamber. Uh, it'd be basically probably at every two week or two week occurrence getting him evicted from the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'd be chucking tennis balls at the lazy politicians sitting there doing nothing. But, uh, so what did you guys think? Again, let us know what, know what you guys think in the, in the comments. I think we asked some pretty pretty hard question. Again, I think it goes back to, again, the questions I was asking before uh, from people. Again, we can we can be told a lot of different things, but when is it going to come down to, you know, actual legislation um, and how long we got to wait for that? I mean, it, it, again, we've got to also come to the reality, guys, uh, you know, which is I don't really want to, but that uh, legislation may not be coming uh, ever. So that's something we do have to think about for the future and whether like, and this is why, again, we've been pushing, you know, that legal route being, you know, one of the, one of the strong ways we're probably moving forward, keeping the government and the police accountable by tying them up in the courts. So that's, again, that's, again, this just gives us more reason again to be pushing that, um, you know, court action because that exactly. seems to be the way to go. Well, this is what Colin said, our, our suppressors, we need a court case, excuse me, where the government gets sued and to make us, Suppress, to make suppressors mandatory. Well, they have gone through a court case here, Farmer, and the court said to the police, give him his suppressor. He is allowed to have one. This is here in Queensland. Police walked out and said, fuck that. We're not giving him the suppressor. We don't want, want him to have it. The courts demanded the police give him the suppressor. And the police just won't do it. Walked away. Said, no, he's not getting it. They're not even listening to the judges anymore. So Happy Hunter. How, how do you win? Happy Hunter said he'd pay money to see in Parliament going off. <laughs> I'd lose my shit. I hate one of the things I hate in life is lazy, leeching people and some of these politicians who are just absolute fifty years in Parliament and all they do is cry about a goddamn uh, dirt road um, that they want taxpayers to pay for. No, nah, nah, I, I wouldn't stand for it. Would not stand for it. Yeah, there's actually a good one there just below that too from JR. He said, good show. It just shows uh, how seriously people are taking you guys. Yeah, obviously we're, you know, ruffling a few feathers, not intentionally. At least, you know, we're not intentionally trying to. We're just trying to get the best deal we possibly can uh, for shooters. Uh, you know, I know Aaron's, Aaron's sometimes a bit more hardcore than I am with the <laughs> things he says and does. But I guess he wears his. I guess he you know, he does at the core really want the best for firearms owners and sort of won't take any bullshit. So I mean, we're too old for that now. We we've been doing this for a quite a long time, yeah, you know, ten years. And when I actually look back, I just think what what actually have we achieved? And uh, you know, it's really not a lot to show for it, guys. Really not a lot to show for it. I mean, you know, we're, Aaron's probably getting close to what fifty. I'm yep. forty in a couple of uh, about two months time. In on April twelfth, I'm forty. I mean, you know, we've only got a very, very short life to live. We need to live it. We want to go hunting and shooting. We want to be left alone by the government. So, yeah, you know, when is that exactly going to happen? And after 10 years, uh, you know, that's why we asked some, a few hard questions today. When are we going to get these results? You know, we live and die by the sword. Again, legislation, when it comes down to it, and I guess you had a good point. If people aren't going to, you know, vote the people in, they deserve what they get. But, you know, are there enough shooters to vote enough people in to make that difference? I don't know. And again, at least in the meantime, we need to start that legal action. At least, at least start tying the government up in uh, in court. 
Well, Liberal Democrats do have other policies, just not shooting, a bit more of a broader range than a lot of the other parties. So there should be something in there for everyone. So I don't know why they don't get more votes. Uh, that's for sure. Um, yeah, we're going on from JR's thing. We had a few people chasing us around with emails and so forth, and we sort of won't go into it, you know. But obviously, people, you know, taking note, they're watching the stream, and that's good. We, you know, happy to have them here on the stream, whether they, you know, like us or not. That's not here nor there. Um, but yeah, we're certainly getting a lot of people watching the live streams. We're getting, you know, a lot of people giving us information, um, sending us documents, and those sort of things that we've been able to discuss. You know, and it's, you know, we're happy with that. We just want to see the organisations again take some sort of legal action. I, I can post. The, you guys see us. We post on Facebook, and, and I think Aaron will freely admit this too. I mean, us posting on Facebook, I admit that it doesn't do jack shit. It doesn't do jack shit. I'm just like everyone else, posting on the internet. You know, we've got to stop posting on the internet. Again, but we don't have any money behind us to do that. That's why, again, we're putting our faith in our organisations with our money, you know, to, to hopefully try and do something, especially the ones with larger ones with, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in the bank. We're waiting. We're waiting for that action. We're waiting for that push hard forward advocating for shooters. And I think the time has come now that shooters are starting to see through this. You just have to look at the comments on the internet that shooters have had a gut full of this. Uh, they're not accepting it anymore. Even the ones that you, know, you might think would have, you know, because a good reputation, right? The, the shooters are starting to ask questions. What are you doing? When are you going to do it? Why aren't you doing it? It's okay to write a letter to the government. The government laughs. Like I had a chat to a lovely fella about duck hunting the other day, and I'm, I'm happy to put the petition uh, up on my page, and I probably will do that tonight. But the government's not going to listen to petitions. I, I'll give you an example. It's not to hassle them, but last Friday afternoon, Aaron, I got a, 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 an email. I must be on their, on their list for SSAA New South Wales saying, oh, don't go into the weekend without signing the petition. We've got 13,000 signatures. That's fine. It will be presented to the government. Government's going to laugh. They don't care about petitions, guys. Every, everyone will tell you that the government does not care about a petition. They'll get out 200,000 signatures, a million signatures, two million signatures. They'll laugh it off and treat us like a pack of idiots. Trust us. The, wasting well, your time doing uh, petitions, just, 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 just instead of using that money and time, just start legal action. Get, get, get someone on the payroll that can just be there full time doing this stuff, getting the lawyers involved at every opportunity. That's what people want. That's what people expect, and that's what shooters and hunters expect going forward. So the time of excuses that, you know, organisations aren't going to do anything, those days are long gone now. And I don't care about being liked, and Aaron doesn't really. All we care about is the best deal for shooters. And, you know, if these organisations get a good deal for shooters, we're, we're more than happy to say that. We're more than, we're more than happy to back them up and, and, and say where good things have happened. See, I like getting these... Um emails, hate emails, I'll tell everyone now, hate emails from other organisations and other people. Um, I like getting them because it means that we're getting to them. Finally, they're doing something. A year ago, you didn't see, see anything happening, did you? Well, we've been doing this for six months now. You didn't see these other organisations doing anything. And there was even one that backflipped on saying they're going to do court action, then backflipped at the last second and left, left shooters high and dry. So... Yeah, it's only just uh, recently you actually start seeing them and it means that we're getting to them and they are um, taking notice of what you guys are saying and you guys aren't really liking many of the organisations out there because they haven't been doing anything. I know NSC have had um, a lot of um, hate in that from uh, staunch supporters of other organisations and parties and they only complain and bitch and carry on like that is because... They're trying to defend themselves for, for their inaction. That's all they're doing. Uh, so they're it's now they're taking they notice. Care, if they didn't care, why would they be on other people's pages commenting and putting their two cents in? So clearly, obviously, it's getting to them. And, you know, I don't blame them. I don't, I don't blame the other organisations probably getting a little bit upset. I'll tell you why, because it just goes to show their inaction has been on show for far too long, you know, and now people are saying, nah, we're supporting this mob. Uh, whether it's the NSC or another, or another organization that's doing something, but let's say it's the NSC for an example. Like, I understand people getting upset. I totally get it. I totally get it because their inaction is now on show. They say, well, how come we weren't doing this stuff before? Why weren't we doing this? How come it's easy for these guys to do it with, like, basically, 
a fledgling membership base. So I don't blame them for uh, getting upset. And that's why you're seeing them. I mean, we're on the internet. Me and Aaron are on the internet. We're on Facebook. We're seeing the the comments. We're getting sent things from other people. We're getting sent the screenshots. And, you know, I just think, good. It's actually good they're on there. They're on there defending themselves. They clearly were getting to them. Fantastic. And this is what we wanted to do. We want to spur you on for action. That's what it is. Instead of whinging at NSC or other organizations, let's let's do something. Do something yourself instead of jumping on Facebook. Yeah, well, the inaction from these other organizations is not the norm anymore. It's not the norm. Action is. They've had it, they've had it for way too long. They just think because they've got a genuine reason, they can do what they like, and people were here for genuine reason. Well, no. There's other options for genuine reasons. There's a lot of small clubs that cost bugger all to belong to. There's a lot of pistol clubs. Pistols cover you. Pistol clubs normally cover you for your rifles and shotguns as well. And people are realising that now. They don't need them for genuine reasons. And your inaction is uh, no excuse anymore. It's not the norm. No, they yeah. want to see action. It's time you saw action. It's quite a funny one. Getting near to the end. Uh, epic flyer. To put it simply, simply put it in layman's terms, WSAA equals small and flaccid, NSC long and hard yeah. and stiff. Love your videos and NSC's work. Good stuff. Mm. Yeah, I mean, people have asked us, oh, you know, you, you're shilling for the NSC. Ah, oh, more, more. I mean, when people say shilling, we're more than proud, absolutely proud. We'll put on display that someone is actually doing something for once. Like if, if that's shilling for an organisation, hey, consider us shills because, yeah, we, we've told those guys before, listen, hey, let's we start you know, doing other things that aren't in line with, um, you know, defending firearms owners and start saying silly things, well, then they'll be called out on it exactly the same. But hopefully we're not going to have to do that. So if that means shilling for the NSC or another organisation that steps up and starts kicking goals too, well, classify us as shills, then i got no problem with that because I'm happy and proud that our money and, and resources are going to pay a barrister to go and try and do things. I don't think anyone here would, would dispute that in the comments. Exactly. And, uh, we, I've had this from the Fisher and Shooters clowns this week. Uh, their supporters and my comments. Oh, you just um, um, cash for comments and page it. Well, I've got to sell advertising. I try and I'm trying to make a little bit of money here for all my time I'm doing. What's wrong with that? You guys go to work. I go to work. And we get paid for what we do. I go to work, then come home and then work on this every night. What's wrong with me trying to sell a bit of advertising? Doesn't matter who it's to. Um, it's just what we got to do. Jason sells advertising on on his podcasts. Um, so what's wrong with me trying to make a little bit of money for making all these videos that cost me a small fortune? Like the advertising doesn't even cover a fraction of the videos I make. That's why the videos have been slowing down because I've got other things in my life I've got to spend my money on. I can't afford to make a gun video every single week. I can't afford it. So when I get enough money, I produce another video. And there is another one coming up soon because of you guys donating to the show, which has been fantastic. But... Yeah, that's what, something I just can't understand. It's how, how dumb people are. They just think that you shouldn't be able to make not make any money. And if you are making money, you're a shill. Well, geez, so, someone's got to turn the lights on. Someone has to pay for, for my internet, for uh, all the ammunition, for all my time to make a video and all my research. I've been on the computer since uh, about 2 o'clock this afternoon and whatever the time's now, 8 o'clock or whatever. Um just doing research in one year. So, uh, Tasmania Outdoor Lifestyle and Preparedness says, Oh, CIFA, chuck in some dollars. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. I mean, you know, I know Rod Drew was the former CEO of CIFA. He was actually not a bad guy. He was the former, I think, CEO or head of Field and Game Australia. Um, yeah, for what I understand, when I spoke to him, he seemed to be like a decent fella. But uh, uh, now they're, they're run by the, the former. Uh, Sydney branch president, as you guys know, was on Sydney branch for quite a long time as well. So, yeah, all I'll say there is don't be expecting too much from them. They'll talk a big game, but unfortunately, again, it will never uh, result in actual uh, a delivery of anything for shooters. So I guess I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, yeah, it's very interesting talk tonight. I really did enjoy it. Uh, an extremely nice guy. I talked to um, Aaron on the phone before, and he just said, ask me anything. I'm not afraid of any questions. Just ask me anything you want. We had a lot more, but he is busy. He is in the middle of the election campaign. So hopefully afterwards, and, and it all calms down, he, he does come on, and hopefully he's still a, an MP uh, when he does come back. Yeah, that's right. I've got an interesting email I just got through here for someone saying, um, this is on my personal email. 
oh, sorry, the podcast email saying they uh, they do some Category D work and they're now being basically they're uh, getting re rejected for the purchase of semi-automatic firearms. So maybe that's something I'll, we'll talk about a bit next week too, one of these emails I'm getting uh, from people. Uh, so, yeah, it sounds like a very interesting one. New South Wales doesn't surprise me. They're always trying to stop suppressors, semi-automatic firearms, even for our <coughs> pest controllers out there. So is anyone really surprised? Yeah, well, it sort of comes on this one that JSO AR15 said, I understand it's the police. That's the problem. Everything works fine in a democratic system and the ministers. Exactly. I just can't understand why they bow down to the police continuously. Police wants this, the police get it. It's like, Jesus, just uh, listen to the people. For now, we, we elect them, we pay them. Just listen to the people. Stop treating people as a paycheck. It's just unbelievable. That's all we are to them. It's just a paycheck. Well, to the majority, I dare say. Um, we're just a paycheck to them, just a way of getting them a new, an, another job. We're their best friends. That's what people got to remember. We're their best friends until the election's over. Then they don't want to know us. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. I mean, where to from here? I don't know. It's a tough road. It's going to be a very, very tough road. But, you know, again, if we all get in together and start laying that money on legal, I just I can't believe we're in 2021 and really the first sort of strong sort of legal action type stuff, at least at tribunals, really only came probably within the last 12 months. I mean, this should have been straight away from the groups, you know, grassroots movement from very early on after the 1996 movement. I mean, if you, you listen to, you know, former SSAA head Ted Drain, uh, the way he used to talk to what we're dealing with these days and the way they talk, I mean, it's to two totally different things. So, um, again, hopefully they're learning from this. I mean, again, like they said, they are commenting, they're on on the pages and they obviously are listening because they didn't care about what we thought. They, they wouldn't be commenting. So good to see. Yeah, man, we would not be in this position now if 20, what, well, 24 years ago, if an organisation had balls and just didn't see it as a good thing for getting people to their ranges. Um, if we actually had, like, an NEC back then, we would not be in this position right now. We would not have lost, probably we wouldn't have lost the guns. We wouldn't have lost all the international contests. I know Aaron Stonehouse, we talked about this before, we didn't get a chance to talk about it on here, that he's not happy about all the... Um, contests and the money that has been lost because of the bans. People can't bring their guns, can't got no international contests over here because you can't bring the guns here to shoot. Just it, It's just a big flow-on effect e economically is these gun bans and it hasn't solved a single damn thing. Gun crime's gone up and it's just, and we've just become a poorer nation for it. Anyway, we're probably going to finish off now. We've got a couple of minutes before nine, but to give that thumbs up. There's obviously uh, uh, eight people decided to uh, give a thumbs down, obviously not liking uh, hearing from Aaron because, you know, we're not pushing other political parties. But, you know, again, we asked a few hard questions there. You know, again, same thing goes. He'll, he'll live and buy the results that uh, he achieves uh, in Parliament, whether he does or he doesn't. That That's still yet to be seen. So it goes for the same things. We need the people that are advocating for gun owners to to vote for the right people that have got the right interests, not ones you know spewing the same rhetoric that John Howard was spewing some twenty years ago. Uh, time to stand up and start defending gun owners. If you're not, you're not going to get the votes. And uh, you know we can be attacked for it. Aaron can be attacked for it. But uh, uh, at the end of the day. You know, it comes down to results and the same thing, whether it's nationals, liberal, labor, shooters and fishers, liberal Democrats, they'll, they'll, they'll all be judged by the, the, the same action. And if they don't achieve, well, then, you know, it's up to you to decide where you put your vote. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, thank you so much, guys, for being here tonight. And uh, once again, you've made it a big live stream. It's just getting bigger every week. We're averaging a lot more than uh, what we were even um, a month ago. So it's been a fantastic night, really enjoyable. Um, we probably, unless something major happens during the week, we're going to try and have an actual gun talk next week. We're going to talk about guns. No, um, not hopefully there's no bans or anything like that. So hopefully we can have a full week of just uh, talking about a gun topic. So that will be next week, hopefully. So, we, just, we just always seem to get hammered every week. We're about to go, what, what gun are we going to talk about or what are we going to do? And then, bang, another gun ban. I get a call from Aaron, another gun ban. I'm like, oh, shit, again, really? How many gun bans can we have? 
And as people have said, if it wasn't for us bringing this every week, the news, because turning a bit more into a news um, show, uh, they would not have known about a lot of these um, gun bans. They wouldn't know about a lot of these problems that shooters are having. They wouldn't know about stuff. It would just be the old norm of inaction. So we sort of do, we don't like bringing, talking about the gun bans, but we sort of want to bring it to your attention and bring the news to you. Because otherwise, as people were saying, we would have never, ever have known about those 15 guns in WA being banned. We would never have known that if we hadn't made the videos on it. So, uh, yeah, we'll round it up now. So thank you so much, everyone. Hit that subscribe button. Give this a thumbs up. And when the video comes out, turns into a video tomorrow, please lay a comment because the comments do help with the algorithm. And remember, we're back on Parlour now. So I'll be pretty much just be broadcasting on Parlour. I don't have much time for Wastebook. So um, most of it will be on Parlour, and I'll just be advertising the videos on Facebook. So go over to Parlour and find me and Jason. Links are down below in the description for our Parlour accounts. And go sign up there to free speech where you're not going to be uh, banned. And uh, there's not many trolls at all there, which is fantastic. Yeah, so, still, still people be hiding behind their scenes with their 10 thumbs down. <laughs> yeah. Hello, wherever you are. See you next week. See you next week. Yeah, and thank you for the view. We really appreciate it. So, um, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for joining us. Have a fantastic night, and thank you to everyone that donated, and thank you, Phantom, we just did. I'm um, sorry I did miss the one there by um, a guy uh, who was talking about the New South Wales bills. Please ask your question again next week and we will try and answer it. So thank you very much, guys. Have a safe weekend and have a good weekend shooting, hopefully, and we'll see you in seven days. Good night.